as my first witness, Mr. Benjamin Lattai. Mr. Lattai, welcome to the advocate. Mr. Lattai is a graduate of MIT. He is an Israeli, and he is a man who has written widely on this question before the House tonight. Mr. Lattai, is the issue of self-determination the core of the conflict in the Middle East? No, I don't believe it is. The real core of the conflict is the unfortunate Arab refusal to accept the State of Israel. And I think, as was mentioned earlier, for 20 years the Arabs had both the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And if self-determination were, as they now say, the core of the conflict, they could have easily established a Palestinian state then. But they didn't. When did the issue arise then? Well, for 20 years, we didn't hear a word about self-determination. And, in fact, what we did hear, those of us living in the Middle East, was about driving the Jews into the sea. Now, after 1967, under the leadership of the PLO, the hardline strategy shifted to adopting a moderate, dressed-up slogan, which uh, now talked in terms of first a secular democratic state and then replaced it with Palestinian self-determination. But what this really means, contrary to what Mr. Aruri said uh, about 1977 being a changed year in the PLO's uh, objectives, <clears throat> let me quote you what the PLO Information Office said in a Dutch paper in 1977, in May 5th. 77? May 5th, 1977, yes. The statement was very simple. Our objective remains the destruction of the Zionist State of Israel. So let's keep in mind that what we're talking about here is not the attempt to build a state, but to destroy one. Do the Palestinians have a right to a separate state? Well... Mr. John has been talking about human rights. Well, I think that it's... No, I don't think they do, but I think that it's quite instructive that the Palestinians who are invoking the right of uh, uh, self-determination, which is, a, is an attribute for separate nations, themselves are the ones who define themselves as part of the Arab nation. Now, no one is denying that there are Palestinian Arabs. There is a very distinguished Palestinian Arab sitting right next to me. But the Palestinians themselves, in the Palestinian National Covenant, the very first article, say that the people of Palestine, quote, are part of the Arab nation. Well, let's look at the Arab nation. It has 21 states, an area roughly the size of the United States, and one-sixth of the entire world's wealth. Now, add to that the fact that there already exists a Palestinian state. And that is Jordan, 60% of whose population is Palestinian. It's, I, think, I think it's quite interesting that Yasser Arafat and King Hussein, who are bitter enemies, agree on one thing, that Jordan is a Palestinian state. So what we're talking about is a demand for a 22nd Arab state and a second Palestinian state. What should, be, what should be done with the Palestinians on the West Bank? It's a problem, so what should be done about it, in your opinion? Well, I think that the Palestinians in the West Bank are going to be offered the full human rights, the full civil rights, as there are no Arabs are offered in the Middle East. No Arabs whatsoever have any full human rights or the right to vote for their own government. Those Arabs who lived in Israel in the pre-67 boundaries are the only Arabs in the Middle East who offer that right, and I'm all in favor of having the same Arabs living in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip being offered such a right in the final peace agreement. Can we have uh, peace in the Middle East? Very briefly, please. Yes, I sincerely hope so. Look, I'm 28 years old. I've had to defend my country in two wars and in many battles. Nobody wants peace more than Israel. But the stumbling block to the road for peace is this demand for a PLO state, which will mean more war, which will mean more violence in the Middle East. And I think, I sincerely believe, if this demand is abandoned, we can have real and genuine peace. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll go to Mr. Adjami. Mr. Adjami, some questions for Mr. Natai. Mr. Natai, you've told everyone that the Palestinians on the West Bank and the Gaza Strip will enjoy full human rights. Could you tell me how that's compatible with the presence of Israeli forces in their midst? Well, uh, the Arabs living now under the Arabs who lived in Israel, 400,000 of them, 400,000, uh, between 1948 and 67, as I said earlier, certainly enjoy full human rights. 
And as I I'm said, not talking about about the Arabs in Israel. I'm talking about the Arabs on the West yes, Bank yes. and the Gaza Strip. If you let me, I'll answer your question, Mr. Ajani, please. Uh, the Arabs living in Israel are the only ones who are entitled to vote for their governments, the only ones who have representative in a parliament in the entire Middle East. Now, it's true that the West Bank and the Gaza Strip are now undergoing a period of transition. In fact, no Arab government has been willing to negotiate so far about this period of transition. Mm -hmm. And I think that when this transition, when negotiation period is ended, th there is no reason why under either Jordanian citizenship or Israeli citizenship, these Arabs will not have the full human rights, the right to vote for their representatives as the Arabs in Israel do, Mr. as hopefully all the Arabs in the Middle East will do someday. Mr. Natar, does the state of Israel itself accept that the, the people in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip have the right to vote on whatever future they choose? Well, Mr. Ajami, we just, I just uh, outlined that in the event that this negotiation process will continue, uh -huh. I'm sure that what we're talking about is, in fact, eventual citizenship of some kind, either Jordanian or Israeli or in any other arrangement, in which these people will certainly vote. Mr. Natai, you've given yourself the right to determine that you are an Israeli, but you've also given yourself the right to negate the other entity, which I think is not somehow consistent with global practice at this time, is it? Mr. Ajami, I have never, never rejected another entity, nor have I ever declared my intent to destroy it, least of all the Palestinian Arabs who I fervently want to live in peace with. All I'm saying is that it is the Palestinian Arabs themselves, their leaders, Arafat, Muhsin, who Morris uh, Abrams quoted earlier, Far Farouk Adoumi, the number two man in the PLO, these are the ones who say they are part of the Arab nation. These are the ones who say they already have a Palestinian state. There is no right to establish a second one on my doorstep, which will threaten my existence. There is no right whatsoever. Okay, Mr. Natai, the... <laughs> you seem like a very patriotic Israeli. Does not the fact of Israeli dependence upon the U.S. in order to maintain its occupation on the West Bank and the Gaza, does this not trouble you at all? Uh, Mr. Ajami, I have... You asked me as a patriotic Israeli, and I'll answer as someone who has fought in the Middle East. Uh, one of the things that I think is unique about Israel in terms of all Americans' allies all America's allies, is that it is perhaps the only one who has taken care of itself so far. And I would think that America, in fact, it's not a one-way street, Israel taking from the United States. Israel is giving the United States an extraordinary bargain in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. It's the one stable democratic ally which the United States can count on. Mr. Natai, in as much as you're a Zionist and are committed to a Jewish state, given the fact that demographic predictions tell us that there will be an Arab majority within the current borders of Israel, does this not challenge the foundations of the very state which you are committed to? Uh, I know of the latest uh, figures, population figures, that mm -hmm. actually show a decrease in the Arab uh, birth rate, particularly in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, mm -hmm. as a result of the higher education and the universal education for women that didn't exist prior to Israel, uh, prior to 1967. Now, if you ask me, would I reject Palestinians or Arabs living in, in our midst? Ridiculous. Of course not. They're part of, they're citizens of Israel. If they... No, no, I'm talking about the West Bank and Gaza. You see, we're still going back oh, to yes, the yes. core of it. Yes, I agree. Whatever okay. will be the final arrangement, these people should be free to multiply as they wish. I think that it is written in the Bible, multiply and uh, be fruitful. I think these people should have that right. I'm not going to start uh, enforcing a birth control program under any circumstances. Thank you. With that biblical injunction, I was going to... Mr. Abram, one more question, Mr. Natai. Mr. Natai, since the subject is what should the United States do, may I ask you if you could summarize why, in your opinion, the United States should oppose the creation of a PLO state? I think the United States should oppose the creation of a Palestinian state for several reasons. The first one being that it is unjust to demand the creation of a 22nd Arab state and a second Palestinian state at the expense of the only Jewish state. I think it also would defeat the hopes of those moderate Palestinians who genuinely want to reach a peace accommodation with Israel. Thank you. Mr. I... Mr. Jami, another question. Mr. Natai, as someone who would say that you believe in democracy, do you believe that Israel can, can continue as a garrison state and still remain a democratic state? Mr. Jami, either you didn't hear what I said before, or for your benefit, I'll repeat it again. No, Israel is, does not intend to remain a garrison state. Israel wants to live in peace and wants to be secure. If that is called, ma involves maintaining uh, military guarantees, our own military guarantees against the destruction uh, of people who surround us, yes, I believe we should fight for our survival. If I have to, I'll fight again, but I hope not to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adonis.